And I'd like you to take your Bibles, please, and turn to Philippians. Uh, Philippians, listen to me. Philemon. Philippians would be easier to find, I think. This brief letter, only 25 verses in length, is a living lesson on forgiveness. We're in the third of our four talks or on this letter, and we again will sit at the Apostle Paul's feet and learn how to forgive. You'll remember that the first three verses give us an introduction, then in verses 4 through 7, the apostle allows us to see the spiritual character of one who forgives, and now in verses 8 through 18, we see and we come to the action of one who forgives. I have, do have an insert in your bulletin uh, that'll be of help to you if you like to take notes. Uh, if you can't do two things at once like me, uh, you may just want to leave it where it is and just listen. Uh, but let's go ahead and read the, the section as we normally do, and then we'll dive in. Beginning in verse 8. Accordingly, although I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to, appe- I prefer to, ref- I prefer to appeal to you, I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord." For perhaps this is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. Let's pray. Father, open our eyes, illumine our hearts to the truth of this most necessary characteristic of, in a believer's life, and that is of forgiveness. Thank you that you are the model of forgiveness, for you have forgiven us in Christ, past, present, and future. In our Goal is not to try to please you by some external effort, for Lord, we do please you, but simply to walk in obedience to you as an act of gratitude for what you've already given us in Christ. Thank you again for this text. Thank you for this story. May we learn its truths. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Just a little bit of review. Uh, My throat is doing... um, fun thing, so just I appreciate your patience. Philemon was a Christian layman who lived in the city of Colossae. Uh, The church in that city met in his home. He was led to Christ by Paul, and listed in the first couple verses is his wife Aphia and his son Archippus. They're mentioned there at the beginning as well. Philemon had a slave named Onesimus. Who, is not, who not only ran away from home, but stole from Philemon as well. He wanted his freedom, and so he chose the path of a fugitive and ended up in Rome, where Paul was under house arrest. And while there, by God's providence, Onesimus runs into Paul. As I said, he's a prisoner, um, He could do ministry while in prison, waiting for his day in court before Nero. Um, But this runaway slave comes in contact with Paul, and Paul led him to faith in Christ. Paul now sends Onesimus back to Philemon with a letter asking that Philemon forgive him for being a runaway and also for whatever else he might have stole when he left. This is a call to a man to forgive one who has sinned against him. 
namely his slave Onesimus. The theme of the letter is forgiveness. But interestingly, the word is never mentioned in the letter. It's almost as if the Holy Spirit kind of made this a fill-in-the-blank um, epistle. The principle of forgiveness is all over the place, but it's never stated as such. Uh, and yet, it's clearly what the letter is about. Another curiosity is that the letter from Paul is, in fact, contains no doctrinal principles anywhere in the letter that provides the foundation for forgiveness. I mean, I would assume that a theologian like Paul uh, would give the theology of forgiveness and then ask the man to forgive, or at least to uh, he would give the biblical principles upon which forgiveness is a mandate. But you don't find it there. The appeal to the letter is not based on principle or theology. The appeal is love. Paul knows Philemon as a godly man. He knows he is a spiritual man, a man whose heart is right before God. And so Paul's appeal is not reason or logic or theology. It is appeal based on love. We assume Philemon knew the theology of forgiveness. And we know that he knows the principle upon which forgiveness is built, the biblical doctrines that led to us, to us being forgiven by God. It's obvious that Philemon was grounded in the knowledge of the word. However, I think we should make the assumption that just because someone mentally understands the concept doesn't necessarily mean they will forgive. As we begin this morning, let's make sure we understand the theology, if, you, if, I, if we could, upon which Paul appeals. <clears throat> As I said, his appeal in this letter is love, but he lays down, um, at least we need to lay down, I think, the, the seven foundational elements of forgiveness that compel us to forgive. Number one, uh, I would mentioned that murder is not only the issue of the sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder. There's also the lack of forgiveness behind that commandment. The sixth commandment, you shall not murder, is just a surface statement that involves more than just the act. For example, Jesus says in Matthew 5, you have heard it said that to people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Anyone who says to his brother, Racha, that's a term for mockery or ridicule, is answerable to the Sanhedrin, but anyone who says, you fool, is in danger of the fire of hell. Jesus said that the God who wrote, you shall not murder, also implies you shall not hate. You shall not hold malice. You shall not be angry. You shall not carry wrath. You shall not seek vengeance. You shall not exhibit a lack of forgiveness. So the theology of forgiveness actually began in the law of Moses with the Ten Commandments, which is a summation of the, all, the whole of the law of Moses. And we're not only not to murder, but we're not also to entertain any kind of thought process that would lead us and, and shape our emotions that would lead us to that kind of act. How can I eliminate these attitudes of anger and hostility and unforgiveness and revenge? First, we must view the person that I won't forgive as a creation of God himself. I must choose to love that person and forgive them because of the image of God in them. That still resides in every single person. 
Every one of us is created in the image of God, though that image nowadays is scarred because of sin. Every believer that is in Christ is a new creation in Christ is holy and bears the recreated image of God. And I'm to forgive them based on and because of that image that has been restored. If I look at an unbeliever who is unholy, who still bears the rem- he still bears the remnant of that image of God from creation, and I am to forgive him because of that. And I am to replace my anger and lack of forgiveness with reverence if and when I see the image of God in that person. Jesus also said that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. When he is asked what is the greatest commandment, he says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. A summation, not of the Ten Commandments, which was a summation of the Law of Moses. Certainly, you hope people would see the image of God in you. Do you think of yourself as worthy of love from your neighbor? Do you find it hard to understand why people wouldn't forgive you? We must realize that the attitude of unforgiveness is just simply selfishness. It is exactly this affection for ourselves that causes us to exaggerate the faults in others and minimize the faults in ourselves. If we are humble and unselfish, we will see ourselves as others see us, hopefully as worthy of forgiveness because of the image of God in us. The proud ego is easily angered and is usually unforgiving because it thinks so highly of itself and hates anyone who offends them. So it's not just the issue of committing murder that God says you must not hate. He says you must not be angry. You must not be unforgiving. And if you're unforgiving, you're simply being selfish. Secondly, whoever has offended you has offended God greater. If God, the most holy, has forgiven the greater sin, can't you forgive the lesser? Does that make sense? David, who sinned against Bathsheba, who certainly sinned against Uriah, her husband, who sinned against his own wife and his own children and his own nation. David, who sinned against all the people, said in Psalm 51, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. David David understood that no matter how bad the sin against another person was, the greater offense was against God. And if God can forgive the greater offense, then why shouldn't we forgive the lesser? It's the very issue in Matthew 18, right, that we looked at a couple weeks ago, where the king forgives the man who has a $13 billion debt, and yet he goes out and grabs the man who owes him $6,000, and strangles him and throws him in prison until he can pay the debt. How in the world (laughs) could he not see that what he has received he should give to the other? Any crime against you is a greater crime against God. Anytime someone sins against you while they do offend you, let's be honest, It offends God more. Why? Because God is more holy than we are. 
Sin is more sinful to him, more offensive to him than it is to us. The same offense may be a serious thing to you, but it's far more serious thing to an infinitely holy God. And yet God forgives. And the truth is, if you don't forgive, you're not like God at all. You're actually more like Satan. What's the theology of forgiveness? God forbids anger, hate, the attitude of unforgiveness, not just murder. And he is the one who is more offended by his sinful attitudes and actions, and yet he forgives, so we should too. Number three, you won't enjoy the forgiveness of God that is ours in Christ if you don't forgive others. We noted that in a sense, our relationship with God, if we refuse to give, forgive someone else, we cut ourselves off from any meaningful communication with God. And we are brought under the chastening of God being his children. We've seen that before. Number four, you won't enjoy the love of your brothers in Christ if you don't forgive. You'll never be able to participate in the joyous communion and fellowship and love of other believers if you can't forgive. Again, the parable of Matthew 18. What did the man do to his fellow servant? He goes out and throws him in jail until he pays him what he's owed. Here is a forgiven man who couldn't forgive a friend. You destroy relationships with other Christians if you don't forgive those who, are, who offend you. And if you don't forgive, if you're unforgiving, they'll rightfully ask God to deal with you. I think it was John Wesley who, who prayed the hounds of heaven after the sinners. Sick em, boys. <laughs> Fifth, if you won't forgive and you'd rather seek revenge, you've usurped the authority of God. In Paul's letter to the Romans in that amazing 12th chapter, listen to what Paul says in verses 14 and 19. Bless those who persecute you. Bless... And do not curse. Do not take revenge, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. We are to leave vengeance to God. When you won't forgive someone, when you carry around that anger and bitterness and hostility, you presume to take the sword of divine judgment out of God's hand and use it yourself. You're saying to God, give me the sword, I'll take over. I need to be the avenger because you're unjust, you're too slow, you're too patient. You don't understand. You don't understand the full story. I'm better able to judge. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is blasphemy. You don't understand fully. He does. You don't know what is needed. He does. You don't know what the future holds. He does. God is far better able to deal with any offense against you and me. He's able to deal with the consequences of sin far better. He's able to do... He has the truest understanding of the situation. He has the right authority. He, has, he is impartial and completely just. He is omniscient. He is eternal. He sees the end from the beginning. He is wise and good in all that he does. And in all his ways, he is perfectly righteous. And his purposes are absolutely true. And we're none of that. It makes no sense for any of us to be so blasphemous as to take the sword out of God's hand and wield it ourselves. 
I see some of you slinking under your chair. I understand. Trust me, I've lived with this for a few weeks. And I don't like it any more than you do. <clears throat> Six, the absence of forgiveness makes us unfit for worship. The Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew chapter 5 through 7, the Lord said, If you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Don't you dare worship me if you're not fully reconciled to your brother. You cannot draw near to God in a frame of mind of unforgiveness. You can't. <clears throat> you are unfit <clears throat> to come into God's presence, to fellowship with God's uh, people, if you're living in a state of aggravated sin of unforgiveness. So the theology of forgiveness involves understanding that God forbids unforgiveness, just like murder. He, though most offended, still forgives, so so should we. If you will not forgive, you, we forfeit communion with him and the love of the fellow believers. If we do not forgive and feel we have to bring our own retribution, we usurp, usurp his authority, and it's an act of blasphemy, and we've also made us unfit for worship. Lastly, seventh, the injuries of offense against you are trials <clears throat> or temptations. Jesus goes on to say in Matthew 5, 44, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. If you truly want to be Christ-like in your actions, if you want to manifest the reality of your union with Jesus Christ, then no matter what anybody does to you, you forgive them and you love them. Every time somebody offends you, it's either a trial or a temptation. If you forgive them, if forgive them it's a trial that produces strength. If you fail to forgive, it's a temptation producing sin. The events that come to you in your life are either the, will go one of either ways. Either you will respond with a Christ-like attitude and it's a trial producing greater righteousness in your life. Or it is the wrong response of unforgiveness and makes it a temptation that produces unrighteousness. And the natural consequences of choosing not to forgive is drinking the poison of bitterness that will destroy you. Now, we assume that Philemon knew all of this because Paul doesn't give, it to him, give that to him in this letter. We're confident that Philemon knew the theology of forgiveness, and so Paul left it unsaid. Paul doesn't build his case on a reaffirmation of the theology, the theological groundwork of forgiveness. He simply makes his appeal based on love knowing Philemon knows this. So verse 8 of Philemon, Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, I don't need to. I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, 
as Paul, an old man and now a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Look, I could command you. I have enough confidence in my commission in Christ. I have enough boldness. I have enough courage as an apostle directly commissioned by the resurrected Jesus Christ to command you to forgive based upon the theology of forgiveness that is mandated by God. I have the divine right. Because in Christ, he's given me a commission and I could demand that you do what is proper and fitting in the Lord what is distinctively Christian, namely that you forgive, yet, verse 9, I appeal to you on the basis of love. Paul loved this man. Verse 1, he calls him beloved, dear friend. Verse 7, your love has given me great joy and encouragement. There was this bond between these two, not just of mutual respect, but of love. So there's no need to command him. Jesus said, if you want to keep the law, do this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, your neighbors, yourself. On this hangs all of the law and the prophets. Paul said in Romans 13, love fulfills the whole law. Love is the highest ground that a believer has in true godliness. And while forgiveness is commanded in Scripture, and it could have been commanded by Paul according to his apostolic authority, Paul knows the man that he's speaking to. <clears throat> and he knows he's motivated by love. And in order to tenderize Philemon's heart, Paul throws in a couple of statements about himself. I then, as Paul, an old man. Paul's probably in his early 60s here. People didn't live that long back then as they do today. And not only is he an old man, but he's been through the ringer. He has been persecuted in ways that we can't imagine. He has been beat up by life, and now he's in prison. To get to the heart of Philemon, Paul uses some th sympathetic words here to pull on his heartstrings a little bit. Now put yourself in Philemon's shoes. He's reading this little letter from his mentor, Paul. He sits in his house, <laughs> and right in front of him is who? Onesimus. The runaway slave who stole from him. Feel the emotion that Philemon must be experiencing. Not only has Tychicus come with a letter for the church, Colossians, that meets in his house, but now there's this personal letter from Paul directly to Philemon, the one who led him to faith in Christ, that grew him up in Christ, but also there's him, the one who stole from me and ran away. He's back. And looking at Philemon eye to eye, and Philemon doesn't quite know what's going on. He's feeling all kind of emotions that make him want to take Onesimus and beat him and put him in prison, and yet Paul says, I'm just going to ask you to forgive him for love's sake. And would you do that, please, because the request is coming from me, an aged friend who is a prisoner.
Acts chapter 28 says that he was a prisoner in a rented house when he wrote this. He had people coming and going, but he was chained to a Roman soldier. And so he's saying, Philemon, can you dare refuse a request from a poor old man in prison? What's the request? What actions is he to take? Starting in verse 10, we get into the nitty-gritty, I think, of forgiveness. And there are three actions of one who forgives that must be taken. Three things that are involved in forgiveness that we must do in order to forgive. The first one is reception. And that is receiving the one who comes and asks. Opening up your life and taking the person back. Look at verse 10. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. <laughs> what? I, I, I can feel finally even, what? How, how did you and him... Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful, both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me with, while I'm in chains for the gospel, I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you would do will be spontaneous and not forced. Just take him back. And do it immediately, Philemon. Because there are three things that are true about Onesimus that you don't know. He is repentant. He is transformed. And he has proven himself faithful to me. That's what Paul says in these verses. He says, you need to take him back because he's ready to come to be taken back. Forgiveness begins with reception personally. And we have to close the gap. We have to cross the bridge. We have to be the ones that will heal the wound. And he says, Paul says to Philemon, let him back into your life. Paul appeals for his child, like Philemon. Paul led both of these men to faith in Christ. Paul says, he is my son in the faith, just like you are, Philemon. Just like Timothy, just like Titus. And this has got to be a shock to Philemon. How does Philemon know this is true? Because he comes with Tychicus. He comes back with this incredible story of his experience with the Apostle Paul, and Paul says to take him back, and, so, and he comes with repentance. What I did was wrong. I admit it. How do we know that? Where's the, re where's the repentance? It, it, it's implied. We know that because he's standing right in front of Philemon. He went back. He did the most dangerous thing a runaway slave could do. He came back to the one he ran away from, who he stole from, humble and repentant to face the man he wronged, the man who has the right and power over his life. He went back. That's how you know he's repentant. You don't have to say a word. Finally, man, just do the deed. Just forgive him. Not only is he repentant, but he's transformed. Look at verse 11. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. He's not the same guy. By the way, there's a play on words here. Onesimus means useful. It was a common name for slaves, probably could have been a nickname. 
useful. But some slaves were named useless. And so those, and those two words are very similar in the original language. And so Paul does a little play on words in verse 11. Formerly, Onesimus was useless, but now is useful, both to you and to me. Why? God has changed him. He's not the same man. He's different. A radical change has taken place, and he's, he's going to serve you the way Colossians 3.22 says, not only with your eye, when your eye, their eye is on you and to win their favor, favor <clears throat> but with, with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. He's coming back a different servant, Philemon. He's now useful, living up to his name. But the third element is that he is Faithful. Verse 12, I'm sending him who is my very heart back to you. This guy has proven himself. It was painful for Paul to send him back, because, but he knew that it was the right thing to do, and so he does. He had to be restored. He had to be reconciled to his owner, Philemon. Paul had an immense capacity to love. And he's come to the point in his life where he loves this man, Onesimus. He says, I'm sending my very heart. The, the word heart here is the word in the original for bowels. The Greek word, world thought that emotions came from your gut. I mentioned that last week. He mentions in verse 13, I would have liked to keep him with me. And then look at this subtle little note here. So that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. What did Paul mean by that? Another way is to, is to look at this is to affirm the gracious character of Philemon. Philemon, I'm sending Onesimus back, and it's cutting out of my heart. I, want to, I wanted to keep him here so that he could minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel's sake in your place. I know you'd want to be here and minister. I know that you, your heart of love, I know you wish you could be here, and I, I thought I would just keep Onesimus so that he could do what you would do if you were here yourself. I know you'd want me to have some ministry, and I know you have done, would have done it yourself if you could. So I thought about just keeping you here, but I, but I had to send him back. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you would do would be spontaneous and not forced. Paul didn't want Philemon to forgive without a choice. Paul gave Philemon the freedom to do the right thing. Not against his own will. That's where forgiveness starts. Yes, you're commanded to forgive, but it's up to you. It starts with opening up our lives and letting the person back in, with forgetting the grudges and forgetting the offenses, simply opening my life and letting them in and saying, yes, if you want to be forgiven, I forgive you. Yes, I can see that you're not the same person that you were before, and yes, I value and acknowledge that. The person that you forgive who is not repentant you'll never have a restored relationship. If there's not repentance, forgiveness is one-dimensional. We are still to forgive because that's what we're commanded to do because of what we've been forgiven. Ephesians 4.32. But if we want there to be a future in the relationship, 
the offender must repent. Second piece is restoration. You need to put him back. You need to restore. Put him back into full function. Verse 15 is fascinating. Perhaps, and here Paul kind of through the side door talks about the providence of God. God's overarching plan. Perhaps the reason he was separated from from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, a dear brother. That's quite a statement. Look, I'm not going to say he's not guilty. Obviously, what Onesimus did was wrong. But I just want you to know that that you might want to consider that maybe this was God's plan all along. Perhaps. Why does he say perhaps? Because we do not know the secret providence of God at work. We don't see it. Remember Genesis 50 20? <laughs> Story of Joseph. Joseph told his brothers when they came back to them after his father has died, they are afraid that Joseph is now going to take revenge for all they did to him for years. Joseph says, You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. <clears throat> Romans 8 28 is still in the, in the book. All things, not some things, all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Next to Romans 28, 828, I have written Psalm 7610. God makes the wrath of men to praise him. God can overturn, overrule any evil. He is always triumphing over human sin by his providential power and by his providential grace. God takes the infinite contingencies and decisions of all humanity and he uses them to accomplish his purposes. That's what he's saying to Philemon. No longer a slave, but better than a slave as a brother in Christ. Forgiveness means we open our heart, we take the person back, we restore them to service. Reception is personal. Restoration is useful. The third component in a forgiving relationship is restitution. There has been wrong done. Wrong needs to be dealt with. How will it be dealt with? Onesimus did run away. He did defraud Philemon. You know what the price of a good servant was back in the first century? 500 denarii. A denarius was a day's wage. So the price in our dollars of a good servant was approximately seventy-five to $80,000. Philemon had to replace Onesimus. Not only that, Onesimus stole from him. We don't know what. We don't know what he took. Money, property, he don't, he, we don't know. But it was significant enough to fund his trip to Rome so he could survive in the underbelly of Rome. How's Paul going to deal with that? Onesimus now has nothing. Like the prodigal son, he'd wasted all his substance. How's Paul going to deal with restitution? 
Verse 17. Oh, I'm way behind, sorry. So if you consider me a partner, a fellow partaker of spiritual life, welcome him as you would welcome me. Verse 18. If he's done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. Paul says, put it on my bill. I'll take care of it. I'll pay for it. In forgiveness, there needs to be restitution. Often the best kind of restitution is just sheer, the sheer gra- graciousness of forgiveness. Philemon, like God, has been violated. Onesimus, like the sinner, ran away from God. Defrauded God, wasted his life. The sinner needs to be reconciled to God, and somebody must pay the price. And the price was paid by Jesus Christ. Paul knows the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ very well, and he preached it for years but now Paul wants to be like Jesus. And so he takes on the debt of Onesimus himself so reconciliation can happen between Onesimus and Philemon. I said it last week, I'll say it this week, I'll say it next week. We are never more like God than when we forgive. Never are we more like the Lord Jesus Christ than when we carry the debt so that forgiveness can take place. What did he say from the cross? Father, forgive them, for they don't even know what they're doing. The letter doesn't tell us what Philemon did. But I'm confident he forgave him and that nothing was charged to Paul. How do we forgive? These three things. Reception. With open arms, we take the person back. Second, restoration. We take them back into useful relationship. Third, we make sure that they have totally and completely paid the debt that is settled. If they can pay... We take the payment. If they can't, we offer forgiveness, and maybe we substitute and make that restitution ourselves. That is the character of forgiveness in action. That is the kind of forgiveness that God gives us, and he wants us to demonstrate to other people. Next week, we'll talk about the motive of forgiveness. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for our time in the Word. Lord, this is hits us almost below the belt a little bit because this is our greatest need. We don't want justice, Lord. We want grace and mercy. And so as a result of the grace and mercy we have received because of the forgiveness we have in Jesus Christ, we are to offer ourselves to other people. Empower us to do what seems impossible, and that is to forgive, to restore, and to make restitution. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.